most of them each other and drink it. Welcome to the Libertarian Counterpoint. I'm Richard Fields. On the program tonight, we have Ted Juba, the 2020 uh, Republican candidate for California State Senate District 1, and John Cameron, the author of Rekill, Rewire, Aristocracy, and a uh, development officer at Pacific Legal Foundation. Welcome to the show, gentlemen. Thank you, Richard. Thank uh, you. The, uh, the state of, well, let me tell you, what, you know, if you're, if you're watching this on uh, Channel 17, we thank you. If you're watching it on uh, on the uh, web at www.accesssacramento.org. That's also a good place. And if you're uh, watching this uh, a little bit tape delayed, it would be on, uh, on uh, YouTube or on, on Facebook. Uh, the state of wildfire control and timber management in California. John, uh, we've had, uh, I think now, well, really two years of pretty much uncontrolled wildfires. Uh, and, and most in a big chunk of Northern California. I was in, in Napa last week and, 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 uh, and uh, uh, Pacific Gas and Electric was so spooked that they might uh, have one of their high lines start a fire because of the wind that they turned the power off, which interrupted my winery tour. So I was not particularly uh, uh, pleased about that, but there was no fire, so I guess it was a good thing. Hmm. Uh, is, 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 uh, what's the relationship between wildfire control and timber management, if, if any? Well, there's a huge relationship. Um, John uh, Muir, when he walked through, I uh, didn't discover, you know, he was, he was one of the first people to report on the beauty of the Sierra, um, talked about their inviting openness. And um, the Sierra was uh, contrary to what one of the senior people at uh, Sierra Club says, who lied through his teeth when asked about the cause of wildfires. Um, the, the reason that um, stands of timber uh, in the Sierra were invitingly open is because of uh, frequent fire. The, the, if, if the ecosystem uh, is either designed or self-designed um, to um, have a number of things happen, and fire control spark beetles, uh, fire um, creates uh, stronger mature trees by by getting rid of weaker and diseased trees. Um, and so when um, they, they put in, the state of California has, has a huge amount of federally controlled and state controlled forests and, and private forests. And if you were to look at, at satellite imagery uh, during these wildfires and look at national forest, California forest, look at state parks and look at private timber, farm timber, you would notice that the, there's there's basically firestorm, uh, out of control fires, fires that can't really be fought until they burn out um, in public land, the commons, and the private lands, um, private firefighters in many cases, but also forest forestry grown, uh, don't burn. I mean they do burn, but they don't burn to the extent. And then the the other problem is firefighting, um, the and bless their hearts, actually, Cal Fire is a mess, but Cal Fire actually fights fires. But um, I have it on, on good authority that what the federal government is doing now when they bring in all their firefighting is they draw a fire line. And fire lines are, are dozed or cut um, ahead of the fire to prevent the fire from, from spreading. That's what, that's what the job is. But what the, what the federal government is doing now when they come in and help fight fires is they put the fire line a mile or two away from the fire so that all the bureaucrats can fly in on government expense and sit behind the fire line and get danger pay and time and a half and triple time and all the rest of that and then fly out. So um, it's, it's a combination of mismanagement um, and in response to uh, the over-regulation caused by um, the environmentalists. The environmentalists basically prevent uh, thinning of forests, they prevent control burns, they don't allow people to um, to harvest felled timber after a fire. It takes longer to get a permit approved to do uh, rescue uh, forestry. In other words, take down trees that are burned that could be turned into lumber off the land. Um, it takes longer to get that permit approved than the useful life of the fallen lumber. So it's, it's combination after combination of a bad government program uh, combined with, with um, some drought 
combined with, uh, in the Napa fire, some freakish conditions that happened 60 years ago and now, and had the same kind of fire storm. So it's, it's a perfect storm of horrible government management, mismanagement, and, and um, the perfect conditions for storms. And also, probably in the case of PG&E, like you mentioned, and I don't want this to be a lecture, um, that PG&E mismanaged um, its power lines. Ted, your, your uh, district is mostly forest land. Is, that, uh, is, is your take on uh, forest management similar to uh, what John has laid out, or do you have a different uh, way of looking at it? So my district is enormous. It runs from Lake Tahoe all the way up to the Oregon border. It includes Redding, which, as you know, is where the car fire destroyed thousands and thousands of homes. And this is all preventable. This could have been preventable by allowing timber harvest as we used to. As is, of, as is designed by the forestry policies that were set out in the early 1900s, actively managed forests. The United Sorry, States Forest Service used to be self-supporting by way of timber harvest fees. So people would buy the right to harvest timber, and a lot of that money from that would go to the Forest Service would be injected back into the local economy. And you could make a living harvesting timber. I mean, a family business, you can make a living put food on your table by harvesting timber, but you can't do that anymore because it takes so long and it's so expensive to get a timber harvest plan approved that now it's really just uh, the larger corporations that have the means to do this. And there are plenty. I mean, we have Sierra Pacific Industries here in California and they- Red. They, they do a lot, of, a lot of timber harvest in this state for sure. But that means of wealth creation isn't available to the people who live around it, which is really unfortunate. Imagine being in your home, surrounded by your own means of creating wealth, and you can't touch it because the government t says. So you can own forest land with uh, harvestable uh, mature trees. You can't harvest those trees unless you go through mountains of red tape and paperwork to get the permit to cut them down. Either you own it or you, or you buy the it. rights from the federal government, because yeah. they're as interested in forest management as the state of California is. Nobody wants to see these huge forest fires. And if we can make economic use of this timber, why not? Why not make that economic use of it, let people create their own wealth in the world, and prevent fires in the meantime? And I'll tell you this, when they go out and harvest timber, they don't just take fuel out of the forest. They build roads, too. So when a fire does start, that's access. So it's more than just taking fuel out. It's enabling the firefighters to do their job better when the fire inevitably does come. And I'm guessing that when uh, timber is harvest, harvested in, in a sustainable fashion, which of course uh, anybody in the, in the timber business would want to do, they're not taking all of the timber, they're taking the selected mature trees, leaving younger trees to continue to grow, or they're doing it in uh, patchwork, uh, patchwork uh, uh, patterns so that, so that there's always uh, new timber growing and always the older, uh, more prone to fire timber being harvested, correct? Absolutely. Nobody's talking about clear cutting the forests here. We're talking about responsible forest management and responsible timber harvest. You can do this in a very intelligent way. If you can carve out swaths of timber that it's advantageous to take that out because it's a tactical advantage against a fire that could come in. You kill two birds with one stone. You're running as a, as a libertarian-leaning Republican, uh, if, I, if I can hazard a guess. I, I am a Republican, yes, but I, we're cut of the same cloth, I think. Okay. Uh, and uh, you're going to be, if elected, be a, a senator from, a, uh, from the Republican minority party in the state of California, to say the least. Yes. What uh, impact can you, as a minority party member, have on uh, timber policy in the state of California? You've got uh, a whole lot of people from San Francisco and L.A. that really don't understand what's going on and could care less. Well, that's a really good question. And that's one of the reasons that I'm doing all this, is that the Republican leadership in this state is about as useful as a tumor. If you have a business and you lose market share year over year over year, that business needs a brain transplant, right? It is time to refresh, refresh the leadership and bring in people who are going to go out there and work together as a team to start flipping districts, start taking back the legislature. So we're more than just an observer in the state legislature. 
we're one seat shy of a super minority in the Senate. And we have one in the Assembly. So really, the Republicans are there just to talk. It doesn't have to be that way. There's plenty of conservative voters in the state, but we're not working together to mobilize that effort to give ourselves more of a voice in the legislature. That's something I want to work on. How would you go about doing that? Well, like anything. As a, as a freshman senator from a, from a, red, a red district. Like anything, it comes down to building a team of hardworking people, right? You can find smart people anywhere. It's roughly a bell curve, but hardworking people are kind of hard to find because they're generally putting themselves to use. There's a lot of hardworking people in my district and in California, and there's a lot of hardworking people who want to see more conservative representation in the legislature, and that's an energy that we can tap into. Um. One of the allied things, or one of the things that kind of works, or uh, is is uh, uh, on the same uh, in the same playbook as, as timber and and uh, wildfire, is is water rights in California. Uh, now this is uh, tends to be more of a Central Valley and uh, than it is uh, your district one, but it's still an important issue. How how important is it in in uh, in uh, the Senate district one? Well, for us, it's very important. We are a significant portion of the watershed that flows down to the rest of the state. So, so the Central Valley is getting your water, in effect. Quite a bit of it. And you hear a lot of that <laughs> from people who live in this district, that we're supplying all the water to the rest of the state. Mm -hmm. And this is true. Yeah. But water in California, for lack of a better phrase, doesn't have a very liquid market. Right? There's, you can make much better no use. No pun intended. No pun intended. You can make much better use of this water if you expose it to free market economics. That's interesting. Uh, Chile, the country of Chile, which has a topography very similar to California. So they've got a central valley. They've got a high mountain range. It's, in, in, in fact, uh, an extension of the Sierra. They call it the Andes. Uh, and the coastal range. So they have a topography that's very similar. And they also have a modified form of property rights in water in Chile. Is that something that you would uh, suggest, having, having a, a assigning property rights to water so that you have a, an, an actual market as opposed to uh, the decisions on how, who, and, uh, who gets water when left to politicians and bureaucrats? We do have property rights in water in California. We have two, two types of water rights. There's riparian rights, which if you own land that has water running through it naturally, you have the right to use that water for some beneficial use on your property. You can't sell it, but you can use it to farm your property. Which kind of takes away from the property rights part, if you can't sell it. Hmm. Sure. That's something I think that's worth addressing, worth looking at at least. But the majority of water rights in California are appropriative. They're contracts between the rights holder and the state, or the state water authority. And like any contract, you ought to be able to sell it or lease it or somehow use the value from that other, if there's a way you can make more value from it than just farming on your land. For example, during a drought, you see farms growing rice. And the reason is because they don't want to lose their water right. These water rights are use it or lose it. So in a dry year, if you have a very senior water right, you can't go and sell it without the risk of losing it the next year. Okay, that which takes away from the property right aspect of the water itself. Uh, is it, would you be willing to put together a, uh, a scheme or a plan in which water rights actually are uh, uh, more tradable and more uh, private property as a point, you know, I mean, we've got an awful lot of uh, consumers of water. We've got this LA and San Francisco, all of the, all of the metropolitan areas which have a huge consumer use of water. You've got the farmers in the Central Valley and elsewhere that use a lot of water. And of course, you've got the interests of fishermen and people who uh, would like the salmon to continue to survive as a species, uh, as users of, uh, uh, who need free flowing streams. So there are a lot of consumer, uh, competing uses for water. And it would seem to me that if you have a, 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 an actual tradable market in water, the highest and best use for that water would uh, be the one that would be used because it would, it would be the one that would attract the highest price. Is that something that you can see uh, materializing in California at any time in our lifetimes? Materializing? Yeah. That's a good question. That depends on how much conservative voice we can get in the legislature. But I will say this. Not making efficient use of that right, that property right, 
that leads to all sorts of weird things that happen, like growing rice during a drought. Yeah. I would imagine if you have a farm and you have a water right during a dry year, that water right is probably worth more than the rice. Somebody downstream is much more interested in growing almonds, for example. So you should be able to sell that water. Having exactly, the having a survive. tree survive. That's a yeah. significant long-term investment yeah. to grow almonds. So if you can sell that water, it seems to me like that should be a good option. The other, plant, the other problem with, with water in California is groundwater, which is uh, receding uh, year over year uh, and has been for, for decades. Uh, is that a problem in Northern California like it is in the Central Valley? Not really for us, no. I mean, we have enough, enough river watershed that there is some groundwater pumping going on, but most of that for commercial use is happening in the Central Valley. It's my understanding, too, that um, even though the, the scaremonger said that uh, after the, the last, before the heavy rains we got, was it last year? Year before last. That they didn't think that the uh, groundwater would ever recover. And it's my understanding from talking to a lot of farmers that, that uh, groundwater uh, historically is at about the same level it was from, from really one super wet year. So, you know, the, the idea that the aquifer, I mean, you can, you can pump an aquifer down to, to, to where it's not economically feasible to, to pull water, but for enough wet years, are going to replenish it. And so the idea that um, this uh, supposedly historical drought that we're seeing and all the rest of that, if you combine it with a, with a lot of pumping, then, yeah, groundwater is, is lower than it was. But really, to me, I think the new laws that are going into effect where I think every county is going to have a groundwater commissioner and they're going to look at legislating groundwater, controlling it, and all the rest of that, despite the fact that, that groundwater is part of, in, in some areas, 100-year-old written water rights. Uh, even over a hundred years, so they're going to go in and suddenly decide that those those property rights we're talking about don't exist, and and create legislation to control it. So, um, you know, given some wet years, and and um, I can't see that you know weather is cyclical. That uh, that um, we're gonna we're gonna return to the mean here pretty soon and have a couple of wet years back to back, and the aquifers are going to recover. One of the uh, interesting uh, things about California is you've got this blue and red divide. Uh, Eastern California is pretty much conservative and Northern California, whereas the coast is, uh, is uh, very much democratic. Uh, and part of that means that, well, and part of, another part of that is that there's a huge population uh, on the coast uh, and a very sparse population uh, inland in California. And uh, some of the most beautiful parts of California are Northern California and Eastern California, the Sierras and, and the Northern and the Alps and so forth. Uh, it, it, and it would seem that population would want to go to prettier places than, say, Watts or uh, San Jose. Uh, not that San Jose is that bad, bad, but I mean, there are prettier parts of the, of, of the state than the California coastal cities, at least some of them. Um, but one of the limiting factors on people being able to live and work in rural areas is internet access. Uh, now that we have 5G coming down the pike, is there going to be internet access in Northern California and will that uh, facilitate more work from home and uh, uh, remote business, uh, businesses in, in Senate District 1? Well, that depends on if we can get the government out of the way and build the towers we need to build to bring access to people. Population is going to follow the economic opportunity in general. Mm -hmm. And right now, I mean, we can't harvest our timber anymore. So, so what have we got, right? The modern means of wealth creation is connectivity. Being able to access customers anywhere in the world and sell whatever it is that you sell. 5G internet is going to change the entire landscape of how network connectivity is delivered to the whole country. This is over your, over your, cell phone, the same wireless signals that power your cell phone, you get Wi-Fi speed to your computer. So you don't need to have a cable hookup to your house. Verizon is already doing this here in Sacramento and in a couple other markets. They're testing it now. And it's pretty cheap. It's like 70 bucks a month. Comparatively, I know people in my district who have satellite internet connections that cost $200 a month. And it's not even fast enough to be able to video chat with their grandkids. That to me is pretty ridiculous. 
that they're paying that much for such terrible service. And the technology has caught up. We have 5G internet coming out. There are a couple other ways using unlicensed radio spectrum that we can replace fiber optic lines. So instead of spending $100,000 a mile to run a fiber optic line, we can spend $8 a mile to do point to point wireless. The technology is caught up. It's just a matter of getting all the regulatory approval we need to bring this out to the remote areas. And you need regula regulatory approval for what? Towers? Is that the primary uh, impediment? You need regulatory approval for the towers. The telco has to license its RF spectrum from the FCC, but they've already done that. So they want to make good on that investment, absolutely. Those are, these are billions of dollars that they spend licensing the spectrum. So as many customers as they can access, the better. And there's a whole lot of customers out there. My district is close to a million people, and there's such poor connectivity. That, to me, is where the free market and the needs of the people who live there coincide perfectly. And but the, the bottleneck is towers, or is it something else? Well, the, the bottleneck now is going to be towers. Okay. After, and who has who who uh, has the uh, who's creating that bottleneck? What what the government Comcast. agencies are, are are responsible for creating a bottleneck in in towers and keeping uh, uh, internet cheap internet cheap fast internet away from the people? It's some combination of state and federal, depending on where you want to build the tower. Okay. Right, it's, you have to get your rights to build this thing from somebody. And even if you're contracting with somebody who owns private property to build a tower, that hill still has to go through local planning. I used to be in the broadcasting business in West Texas, and we built a tower. We had to make sure that we got it cleared through the FAA. This is a, a, an FM tower that was 1,000 feet high. We had to make sure that it was cleared through the FAA to make sure planes wouldn't run into it and that it had the right number of red lights on top. And uh, we had to lease the land uh, on which to uh, uh, build the tower. That was it. Make sure the planes don't run into it. Lease the land. You're good to go. Hire some uh, uh, American Indian crews to put it up, and, and you got you got yourself a tower. Uh, it's not like that anymore. Well, <laughs> doesn't need to be a thousand feet high. Is it well, like eighty be, what, eighty feet? Something like that? I don't know how high these cell towers have to be. Certainly not. Uh, yeah, yeah, no. But certainly for, for a land lease, that's going to go into local land use ordinances. So if you want to do a land lease to build well, we a tower. Have, we didn't have any ordinances in West Texas. We just built. Well, this is Senate District 1. We have ordinances <laughs> for everything. You can name it. We've probably got an ordinance for it. Even if you disguise it as a tree like, like some of these cell towers I see? You'd be surprised at how tricky planning commissioners can be when they're doing inspections. It's got to be a native tree. It can't be a palm tree. Because they're not native. Okay, so anyway, what would you as a senator do to uh, free up the ability of uh, people who want to build towers to bring internet to the people? What would you do to make that happen? Well, there's a regulatory overhead for sure. There's ways that the state can step out of the way to make this permitting easier. And also, there's, there's going to be a significant pushback from industry on this. They're going to resist this technological change as much as they can. Why? 5G internet is an existential threat to a company like Comcast because oh. they've, they have invested billions of dollars running copper wires ah. to people's houses. Okay. And now we can just do it over the air. Right? That's, that sunk cost and that investment is going to evaporate. Hmm. Now, I don't, I don't know how much influence they have in Sacramento, but I would bet they've huge, got some. Huge, huge influence. They have a senior vice president of government relations, and his only job is to is to try to, uh, or her only job. I don't know who's doing it now. It's not their stated purpose, but their their real purpose is to um, use the government to thwart competition and grease the wheels to make sure that Comcast gets their way. And I don't, uh, you know, that's that's the problem with with uh, the problem with the Commons when. It was, if it was any other way, what would happen is the, the highest bidder, you know, these would be property rights that you could buy. There's all sorts of, you, walk, you talked about unused spectrum. There, there is unused spectrum out there that could compete with 5G if they'd open it up. Um, there, the technology exists for 5G and other competing things. And, and it's really all about people protecting their own um, through quasi-monopolies. These, these, uh, there used to be AT&T, it used to be the three major networks, um, and that was it, and slowly, you know, people chipped away at it, and now you have cable, you have all the rest of that. 
But, but what's happened instead of the old quasi-monopolies, you now have the new. And so, you know, Comcast, like I said, really has, and Time Warner and all the other, all the other big cable companies, um, you know, face a threat. It's like okay, they, so yeah. so I mean, yeah, uh, yeah. established large companies trying yeah. to prevent their mo or pr protect their moats, uh, and that and moats are, are, are a big uh, problem in California politics mm -hmm. and, and the economy, which is one reason why small business and entrepreneurial uh, uh, entrepreneurs are, are leaving California for, for uh, other states. What can be done to uh, improve the uh, opportunities for small business to uh, thrive and prosper in California, and entrepreneurs to do the same? What well, California? Yeah. Oh, uh, me or yeah? Oh, I'll go, John. I'm sorry. Okay. Go ahead. Yeah. 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 I had I had my name written down. Yeah, it's okay. okay. I'll yeah, you know okay. Ted can Ted Theodore Teddy. We got we got two minutes I think to talk yeah. about it. Uh, Sacramento, through a recent poll, is the most difficult major city in the country to start a new business in. Um, the cost of creating and running an LLC not only in, which is a limited liability company, which you typically want to do to limit um, a financial exposure and liability in case there's something wrong, uh, is uh, most expensive to set up in the state of California and preparing a tax return for it is the most time sensitive. The state of California requires, of all the states, it's in the top two or three and requiring licensing and certification to do jobs compared to other free market economies. Um, the, the number of inspections that you face as a business because the, the, the mouth of the devil is here and all the bureaucrats are here. I mean, just running a car dealership here compared to even other parts of the state is more labor intensive because of regulation and control and all the rest of that. It's difficult here. And small business is the, the engine of the economy. And they're trying to kill the engine here. A couple of questions since you're running for Senate on a couple of uh, hot button uh, topics. Gun control in California and now ammunition control. Where do you stand? Where is it going to end? That's the real question. How does somebody know that so the, the... I, I take it by that answer that you are not in favor of those things? No, not even in a little bit. Okay. Education in California, public versus private. I am not a fan of charter schools that are paid with taxpayer dollars that are profitable for for-profit corporations. But the legislature has recently remedied that. And uh, how do you feel about homeschooling and other uh, methods of educating that are non -public? I think homeschooling is anybody's right to do. That's very good. Thank you very much. We're out of time, so we'll see you again next week, same time, same place, on the Libertarian Counterpoint. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Richard. Thank you. It's quite